This is the Drummers Only Podcast, brought to you by the UK's leading drum store. Hey everyone, quick public service announcement ahead of this podcast. It became apparent in the edit that my footage was blurry, um, so that is why you see me appear uh, in a little box on the screen rather than it, it being a couple of different angles. But we didn't think it was fair to n- not use the footage of Darren, so that will explain why this one perhaps will look a little different. But I hope you enjoy it, and thanks again for watching, listening. Please like, subscribe, all that stuff. It helps us grow the podcast and uh, all that jazzy stuff. So, we'll see you soon. Bye. Hello, everyone. Drummers Only Podcast, episode number 70. Uh, and we are here with the wonderful Darren Ferrugia. Hello, Darren. Hey, how are you? I'm very well, man. How are you? <laughs> Good, thanks, and thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. So Darren uh, is not from round our way, as you can probably hear. He's from Australia, and he's on tour right now in the UK with a well-established Australian band called The Cat Empire. Uh, it's kind of ska, solely punk outfit. Is that about right? Yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of all over the map, right? You know, when people ask me what sort of music it is, um, it's really hard for me to kind of classify stylistically, but there are, you know, there's some ska and reggae, and then there's a lot of, um, you know, Afro-Cuban influences as well. So, you know, from a drummer's perspective, there's a lot of nice, there are are a lot of nice grooves to play. Yeah, sure. Um, So Darren um, is is a fairly big deal back home, and he he has... um, Recorded and played with quite a few, yeah, pretty big artists from Tom Jones, Tina Arena, the Commodores, Curtis Daggers, Trisha Yearwood, Joe Cocker, Ray Davis from the Kinks, BB King, Bonnie Ray, Randy Crawford, Eartha Kitt. It's quite a big list. Uh, in amongst having two books out called The Groove Perspectives and The Groove Perspectives Play Along, uh, and a great, really great YouTube channel that's worth checking out. Um, and yeah, a session, just a bunch of sessions from from sort of all over. Uh, I hope I haven't missed anything. Uh, no, that's uh, that's that's the extent of my career. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, if I had that career, I'm pretty happy, man. That's 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 some. There's a lot of ground in there. Yeah, I, I a lot of different um, music. Yeah, there is. Uh, you know, like the the bulk of the artists that you mentioned uh, were the result of me playing on a TV show, which was a variety show in mm-hmm. Australia that was uh, that ran for 27 years. And for the last nine years of that show, I was the house drummer. And so, um, you know, like the, like the drummer in the house band. Mm-hmm. And that was 42 shows a year. So that was every Saturday night for 42, 42 weeks of the year. I did that for nine years. And during that time, any visiting artists uh, you know, if they were in town to promote a, a, a record release or to tour or whatever, would come onto the show and to promote, you know, whatever it is they were trying to promote. Mm. And then in in some occasions, actually I would say a lot of occasions, there would be situations where that artist didn't have a band. So they would just come on the show and play with the house band. So that's, you know, how I got to play with people like Tom Jones, B.B. Uh, King, yeah, Bonnie Raitt, Jackson Brown, there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, those nine years make my CV look fairly impressive. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you've, there's some clips on your YouTube from this, those kind of situations. And you, I'd imagine, pretty quickly got to get inside that music and sort of get to know what someone wants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny, you know, like now think about it back in the days of, you know, that was the 90s. So there, the MP3 wasn't around. So, right. so e- and I guess email wasn't around. So you couldn't just sort of email an MP3 to somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically we just went in and re- read it. So right. we had, and, and the musical director was and still is an incredible arranger. So, you know, we would just go in and read through the chart and then if the artist had any suggestions or recommendations you know we we would we would change those things so for for the most part we would actually you know go in and play something without really uh hearing it and then they might say all right let's come upstairs uh, go into the the control room and have a listen back to it or here's the original version so it it was essentially a reading gig 
Wow. Okay. That's like we got away with it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, is it your man? Is it Skunk Baxter? Is that his name? Yeah, Skunk Baxter. Yeah. yeah. Some heavy blues going on, and then the next thing, the next video up there, I think is is it Jackson Brown's on on there? Is on and Joe Cocker's on there, and they're all stylistically kind of across the map. So you, yeah. You, you can't blag it. No, no, exactly. And I, I got to say, that, you know, credit to pretty much all the musicians that played in that band were really versatile. So you know, yeah, one week it might be you know us playing a, a jazz, you know, jazz thing or a big band style thing, and then the following week it'd be a rock pop thing, and then uh, it could be you know someone from who's who's doing a musical theatre thing and mm. we're playing some kind of Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> song you know so it was um you know there was a lot of variety and and you know in terms of let's say the choices that i made as a uh, a kid sort of wanting to be a professional drummer a full-time drummer um was you know knowing that you know the more versatile i am you know the the, the greater the chances mm. of me you know getting the amount of work that i would need to get in order to sustain some kind of income and so that that attitude that i had as a kid was um really helpful when it when it came to doing that show mm. in addition to the you know the other skill set which is you know just being able to read and you know play with a click and all of that yeah and these are things that are kind of fallen by the wayside let's just say you know like um i don't know how much of all that stuff is, is getting taught as much as it should maybe you know when you know about you but coming up we had to learn styles yeah yeah absolutely you didn't get away with it you know you need yeah. to be able to play at least a rudimental bossa nova. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like a, a show to and a, and a country thing, and you know, and and that's kind of proof in the pudding that it works. You know that you can. You were put in a situation where you're like, it's cool. I, I kind of have an idea at least of what should happen. Yeah, that's a very interesting thing because I think, you know, at, at the risk of sounding like the old guy. <laughs> With his fist, yeah, yeah, exactly <laughs> that guy, you know, and uh, you know the kids of today. But I, I think, you know, maybe as a result of the times that we live in, people are sort of more prepared to specialize, which is a great thing too. But you know, I was, you know, understandably very concerned about how much work I could get as a musician. So yeah, if I I, I needed to be versatile. So when I studied with my teacher, uh, you know, my main teacher between the ages of fifteen and eighteen. We went through a lot of styles, you know. We learnt Latin and we learnt, you know, rock, and then we learnt, you know, some funk things and whatever, you mm. know. And and then, yeah, learning all of those kind of less, how, how do I put it, less attractive things like learning how to play a, a polka or a waltz, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. And then you think, oh, well, you know, um, it's good to learn. When am I going to use this? And then all of a sudden, you find yourself in, you know, musical theatre. Mm -hmm. And you know, I would say that. Um, you know, musical theatre these days is the area where you're probably required to know a lot of stuff. I've been doing a lot of it. So yeah, I, I you would actually, know, so yeah. yeah. Absolutely, like, yes, you do. You know, the last five years I've done shows that range from uh, Calendar Girls in Greece to Oliver and Fiddler on the Roof and, like, talking about a polka, played Fiddler on the Roof and, and all that kind of sort of klezma and, yeah. and, and all that stuff that's really quick. You got to get inside it, absolutely, man. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I wonder. I read what was I talking about, or, or, or you know, that or, or reading, listening to someone talk about how the people these days. It was a Broadway thing, and 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 there's there's guys that come out of college and want to get a Broadway gig, that have no understanding of the music. They can play the notes, but they don't know the music. You know, so having to understand how how a, a klezmer tune. What's the point of it, and, and what are they? What are they doing? And if you ever, have you ever seen a Jewish wedding, when they're dancing on chairs and all that? I, I've, well, I've played hundreds of Jewish weddings. <laughs> okay, right. So yeah. you get it. Yeah. So you, when that, if if you were to be put in that position, you understand the point of what you're trying to achieve, rather than just going, dum, but, dum, but, dum, but, you know, it's not just that. There's a whole point to it. It's a folk music. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's some culture attached to it. Of course, of course. That's all any music has really is a kind of folk music or, 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 or a way of telling a story. But I think a lot of people haven't read the story. <laughs> you know? Just looked at the cover. Yeah, they read right. the synopsis. Oh, I get it. You know, yeah. Now, how many of us passed their English exam that way? Just read the blurb of the book and just, ah, it's about this. But 
when you want to make a career out of playing music, I think you, you kind of need to have an understanding of it. And I think right now for you, certainly, it feels like that's come good again. Yeah, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, like I said, with this band, there's so much variety in what I get to play. I'm mm. not just playing a sort of backbeat on two and four for every song, you mm. know, and, and the songs are really well arranged. So, that, you know, some songs may go into some kind of soca thing and then they'll go into a reggae thing or some will have an Afro-Cuban influence. Uh, I, I think on top of your bass drum, you've got three, you've got a cowbell, a block and something else. I've got, yeah, two cowbells. So I've got a cha-cha bell, a timbali bell and a, and a block. Yeah, so like, when was the last time anybody had three... Three percussion instruments on top of the bass drum, right? Well, it's the first time I've had three <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. in so, all these years. And and you have to understand what each of them do because they do different things. Yeah, yeah, they, exactly. They, 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 people look at it and go, oh, it's two cowbells. Well, it's not. They're four different things. You know, the patterns are probably different. Yeah, the patterns are different. You know, so the, you know, the cha-cha bell I use in a song, I use in three songs and in one, one of the songs it's pretty much like a cha-cha but with a back beat. Right. So I'm playing the right hand on the cowbell and the left hand's playing the back beat, but playing all the upbeats on the hi-hat. Right, okay. So there's that. And then, <laughs> then the other song is, um, we do is like a 6-8 Sega type mm -hmm. of um, tune from the Seychelles. And that's, you know, the, 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 the cowbell rhythm's great because it's just the first two notes of every triplet. It's like one, two, right. three. And again, I don't really get, get to do that sort of thing. No. So again, that's a, a thing that I've learned to play whilst on this tour. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, the other cow, yeah, that's just different rhythms for different cowbells. Yeah, it's, it's super hip, you know. Yeah, it's, it's good. And, it, and it's kind of, and, a, and a, I, I don't want to sound like Man Shouts at Cloud, but in, in the time of homogenised sound and music, kind of refreshing, right, to be doing something that's not, you, you haven't even done in your career, you know, so far. Yeah, I, I love it. You know, I just love the opportunity to learn to learn something new, regardless of whether it's a musical thing or anything. Yeah. You know, I, keep I, I don't know what it, I, I've, be, I've become very obsessed <laughs> with, you know, every day I have to learn something that I haven't learned before. And it could be, it could come out of discussion about, oh, have you seen this documentary? Mm -hmm. No. So that's it, whatever. But I, he, he, here's an example of the kind of nerd that I am. <laughs> uh, I was in a hotel in... Coventry we had a hotel for a couple of nights and I thought I, I should do some washing and so rather than going to a laundromat I thought you know I'm, I'm actually gonna just wash the wash my clothes in the sink right all right so easy like that's just that's there's nothing but you know I have I'm the sort of guy that has to go and watch two or three YouTube videos right. to figure out the best way to do it and what the what you know a better system of doing it that's just how I am so um that's pretty sensational yeah it's Problematic, perhaps. Well, I mean, it, if you end up, you know, soak, soak in the bathroom, it's problematic. But in the main, I think adding strings to the bow is always good. Yeah, it's it's, it's that that attitude, um, regardless of what it is. It, it's like, what's, how do people do this who know more about this than I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for a musician, that is a tremendous attitude to have because you're not going to settle. Yeah, I know, I don't want to settle. No, but many people do. Yeah. And phone it in and, and, and then these people end up kind of miserably unhappy and, and one start to question why they're even doing things like playing the drums, which is one of the biggest joyous gifts that anybody can be given to actually do this for a living is, is pretty remarkable, I think. Yeah. You know, um, I've noticed as well that um, your, your vlogs and your, your Instagram content lately is... is has been very tourism heavy because naturally yeah. you're you're seeing parts of the world you've never seen. This is going to sound like a strange question, but do you think that informs how you play? Gathering more knowledge about the regions you're in and, and the people that you're meeting and the, the people that are coming out to see you play and things like that. I don't know. I don't know if it has a, has a direct influence on how or what I play, mm -hmm. but what it does is it reminds me. Of, of how incredibly fortunate I am to have an opportunity that puts me in that position mm. anyway. So, you know, here, you know, on this tour, I, I've visited a whole bunch of cities that I haven't been to. So, um, you know, as a band, we would hang out and, you know, when, when we were in Valencia, we had a day off. So we hung out and mm. 
grabbed food. And all of, the, all of those experiences, uh, you know, they sort of enrich the entire experience and they make me a happier person. Mm-hmm. So by the time I go out to play a gig, mm-hmm. I'm in a really great mood. Mm-hmm. I'm really happy. I'm getting all this incredible feedback from the audience. Mm-hmm. And so it's a total experience. Uh, it, it's it's even more pos- positive for me than it would be if I just sat in my hotel room all day. Okay, it's time to go to sound check, and yeah. and it, that that feels more like work to me rather than having that sort of tourism by tourist by day, yeah. musician by night, and that that's what's important to me. Yeah, and it sounds like an obscure question, but where I was going to go with it, and I think what I, I would hope if I was in that position I would think this way is that the people that are coming to see you you're there to to lift them out of their life exactly for like two or three hours of the night you know they may be having a, a tough day but they've come to see what is from what I can understand a pretty decent party band man that but the vibe on that stage and the atmosphere is pretty big so and the sing-alongs and all that that's going on and, and they've paid good money to be there all of those things. So you're getting to see firsthand kind of how these people live and then how they party. You know, I'd imagine that's certainly I would like to think I would adopt the same attitude that you've got, you know, because I think it's really positive. Yeah, that's exactly right. And funnily enough, <clears throat> we as a band had this discussion the other night. We, we were playing in um, Bournemouth and the venue was outside of Bournemouth in a town called Boscombe. And, you know, we walked around that day and we could see that it was, you know, like maybe a slightly lower socioeconomic yeah, area. Class or something. Yeah. So that night that we're playing in that town is probably actually most likely the biggest event that's happening there mm-hmm. that night. Mm-hmm. And so we, we are lifting people out of their day-to-day life so that they can forget about all of that stuff. And... If you take that on board, it, it affects your performance. It affects the way you interact with the audience and connects with the audience. And it's so important for you to understand where, where as a musician, where you fit in that. And that's, mm-hmm. that, that's so special. That's a, an incredible privilege to have, you know, and so therefore an incredible privilege to share with those people, get the feedback from the audience and, and you know, just give them the best time that they've, had for maybe half a year or a year or a week yeah. or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you've ever met your heroes and been disappointed, but it, it's it's kind of not too dissimilar to that. You know, you go and see someone in clinic that might be a bit like standoffish or something, or there's context that you don't understand. So, uh, you know, to, to give these people back, I think, is amazing. Yeah, you know? I, I think it's important for musicians to realise that that is actually part of our job. It's, yeah. Is you know just to it, at the very least just to be aware that <clears throat> people have come out to see you and spent money. Mm-hmm. We don't know how that how they earn their money, so they're probably either doing it you don't know tough or or not. But they're spending money to be there, and they want to have a great time and just forget about life for a while. If you can keep that in the back of your mind, that does uh, enrich your experience of that mm. performance. Um. It sort of leads me into thinking about things as a musician that you're not often taught that you have to learn, and I think that's one of them. Is there anything else for you you think that, God, no one ever taught me that? You know, we, we learn the patterns and we learn where the time is and all that, but we don't learn things like, no one really teaches you, by the way, if you don't turn up on time, that's not great, you know, because not everybody has that forethought, you know. Is there anything you've learned over the years that you think, oh, God, I wish somebody had taught me that, that I didn't have to learn the lesson, or you, you had the, the wherewithal or foresight to see it? I think, I think I probably had the wherewithal right. and the foresight, but that has come about through being a student uh, and having a great teacher. Not that he necessarily taught me those things, but the, the way I see it is that your drum teacher can actually be, you know, the best agent that you will have. Mm. And what I mean by that is that, you know, like as a drum teacher myself, if I, you know, if I have a student that turns up every week on time 
really well prepared. They've practiced everything they need to practice. And then in addition to that, you know, they have a real positive attitude towards learning. You can see, you can pretty much tell that this person has the right attitude. Yeah. And then the same for the opposite. You know, if someone's not turning up or cancels or doesn't turn up with their, their money or just basically demonstrates a certain lack of enthusiasm or, you know, not really doing it for the right reasons, then I'm not going to pass any work to them. Mm. So it's usually the other the other version of that student that I think, okay, well, when this person is ready and it's not going to be that far away, mm. they're the ones who I pass work on to. Mm. And I don't think a lot of students get that. A lot of students don't realise that their drum teacher is actually the one that can actually pass their name around. I didn't for the longest time. Didn't get it, you know. Um, I think I was just into it. You know, and I think you either have that, or you don't. And there's, there's, you know, we've all taught. I used to teach about. We've all taught people that are kind of pushed into it. Mum and dad want them to do something, so, and they've shown an interest, so they they come along. But yeah, they're checked out, right? They're not. You say, as you say, they don't really have that positive attitude or that growth attitude. You know, they just want to sort of pass an exam or whatever. But I had no idea for the longest time that teachers give you gigs. Yeah, I can't do every gig that I get called for. And in addition to that, there's a lot of time. There are a lot of times when someone would ring me up and say, "I've got this gig. Do you, have you got a student that would be interested in that?" Mm. You know, or or I might get offered a gig that I probably can't do or don't want to do, and I think, you know, a student is going to get a lot more benefit from this experience than I am. Mm-hmm. So I, again, I would pass my uh, my students' number onto those people. Mm. Do you see the teaching role as a kind of mentorship role as well? Yeah, it should be. Yeah. Because you, you know, with the right student, of course. Yeah. I mean, and we talked about it before we started uh, about the relationship you have with your teacher and, and, and that kind of thing. And I have a very similar relationship with with a lot. I've had a few teachers over the years and, and still maintain friendships with them. I think it's really valuable and important. Um, do you still, or do, I mean, is that part of your teaching now? You, you mentor people as well? Um. Yeah. Sort of, I, I, what I mean is beyond the sort of physicality of playing the instrument. Yeah, I, I guess I do. Uh, you know, a drum lesson could be anything from, you know, learning how to play a funk groove to a deep chat about, you know, what it takes to um, be a professional musician or what it takes to deal with criticism or what it takes to deal with, uh, you know, input from a producer or advice from a musical director or anything like that you know and all of that's based on my experience sure. as a as a working as a working drummer yeah yeah it's a funny thing is you know i think teachers come along in your life at um, a variety of different periods for me i think the most important one is the first teacher you ever have because they can either make or break how you take to the instrument you know you either are, are going to get a lot from it or they're going to dissuade you my brother was um he's dyslexic and he didn't find out till he was like 18 and he had a bunch of he played saxophone and teachers just put him off playing because he couldn't read he couldn't actually physically do it then the, the notes would move around on the page yeah. and stuff so they all thought he was dense but he would have been a ridiculous improviser like he, he would have just been on a level because my, my brother's kind of like that like he, he just sees the world in a pretty unique way so um his teacher actually forcibly put him off and i think that's it's kind of a shame really you know and yeah that is a shame um because there was no sort of there was no there was no looking beyond the, the physicality of playing or reading you know there was no oh, is something actually going on this kid yeah I, th- that's uh that's interesting because then that that goes towards an area of um you know how educators how or how prepared educators are at dealing with a situation that's not the norm you know how how mm. how does an educator deal with someone who's dyslexic mm-hmm. or has you know a physical disability mm-hmm. you know that there's that and um that is a you know that's sort of t- that's almost now, now getting into specialized areas of teaching yeah maybe maybe it's and, a little it's a, it's above a drum podcast pay grade, but but yeah, it's it's a, that's a real shame, and I, I hear that a lot. You know, I, I, I my, like my son as a, a little kid showed a lot of 
promise as a drummer. Mm. Um, you know, when he was, you know, five, six years old, he, he could he could play he could play better eighth notes than I could at that age. <laughs> And it always fascinated me. But by the time he got to high school on a music scholarship, he got thrown into the percussion chair of an, of an orchestra and just basically stood there counting bars yeah. before he, you know, a hit triangle. it, yeah. you know, yeah, before playing the one note on a triangle. And I think that just completely ruined his enjoyment of music. And, and it's, to a the, shame. it's a real shame. It, 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 it sort of annoys me. And that's because, you know, the school was set up to teach a certain thing in a certain way and you had to comply to that. And so this school didn't have, you know, a, a rock band, for example. Mm, yeah. Or, you know, because it was a bit too, you know, it's either jazz or orchestral. Mm, buttoned up the back. And they, and they didn't have a rock band. And they, that, so they, they sort of shunned the whole pop music thing. And, that might have been an opportunity for him to learn how to play in a band, and and and, and so unfortunately, he, you know, he's he's just one example of you know many many that maybe sort of bypassed music just because of the way it was taught. Yeah, yeah, that's a shame. A shame. Talking, I, I mean, we're, we're we're talking about teaching. Your your YouTube channel is is pretty dedicated to teaching. There's a, there's a lot of amazing lessons on it, and one of the the sort of key takeaways I got is that you have amassed quite a bit of language, whether it be from sort of tradition, like bop language and, and, and on uh, to sort of more fusion-y based language, but steeped in things like rudiments. Was that always conscious to, to sort of learn, this is going to sound really stupid, but learn the instrument? Do you know um, what I mean by that? Yeah. I, I caught up with this, an ex-student. So when I, I lived in London for about four and a half years, and I taught at a place called Drum Tech, and, and oh, yeah, I, yeah, right, yeah. I, I met up with a student right. who I haven't seen for, you know, getting close to nineteen years, and he, re I had, I had no recollection of this, but he reminded me <laughs> of the first class that he had with me, and where, and apparently, what I did was I sat in front of a kit, I sat, sorry, not, I sat behind the kit, and I played all this stuff. I said, before I talk, I just want to play for you. And I played for maybe a minute and I played a groove and some fills and whatever. And this is apparently what I did. So he's explaining this to me. And then when I finished that, I said, did anyone notice anything that I played? And my point was that uh, what I had played, everything that I had played was based off a single paradiddle. And that that experience for a lot of kids in the in that class sort of drew some gasps because they hadn't really seen or heard someone demonstrate it that way. Right. So in that sense, what my uh, intention and still is to this day is just to get people to understand that, you know, not all rudiments, but some of this stuff is really great for developing vocabulary. Yeah. And what I noticed, again, when I was teaching there and, and still teaching now is, you know, when, when someone comes for a lesson, I'll get them to play a, a variety of grooves and let's throw some fills in there. And for the most part, a lot of the fills that they play are just based on single sticking, you know, mm -hmm. just right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. And so my, what I'm trying to achieve by doing this is getting them to understand that, you can make some really great fills or just expand your vocabulary by using things that are not just right, left, right, left. You know, mm -hmm. so paradiddles are a great example or other rudiments or other sticking patterns. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, the YouTube channel, the, it's really just me sharing stuff that I know and in, in the hope that, you know, it will resonate with people mm -hmm. and, and people will take that you know, concept and then run with it and do something mm -hmm. of their own with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that how you were taught? Not necessarily. Right. I wasn't ta taught that way. I mean, certainly my first teacher, you know, Frank Corniola, it was very, uh, you know, it was like important fundamentals, you know, mm -hmm. like starting at how to hold the sticks, how to play the three basic rudiments, got me into coordination, you know, like I was using my left foot from a very early point right. in my learning. Uh, so that went reading, learning to count and read at the same time, you know, and then, like I said, going through a whole bunch of styles. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of develop, you know, working on concepts, that probably came a little later. Um, after I learned from Frank, I had lessons with Virgil Donati for a few months, oh, okay. which yeah. was, that in itself is a whole other 
podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, pretty much. I mean, there, there are just incredible experiences that came out of that career-wise for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was only a three-month stint of, you know, okay. turning up to his house nine o'clock every Wednesday morning. <laughs> and I, that was every week for three months. And it was intense. And it was yeah. it's exactly how I wanted it to be. Yeah. Then, like, another six days of shed in the absolute hell of whatever it yeah. gives you. <laughs> Yeah, um, but I wouldn't have been I wouldn't have been able to do his lessons without the three years that I spent with Frank right. because you know, like I said, Frank got my hands to a good level, and uh, and got my coordination to a really good level yeah. as well. Yeah, just, I'm just think what I'm thinking about is that sort of again sort of growth mindset that you're talking about. You talked about it earlier about learning, but you know, not everybody understands how to take a concept and move it. You know, even shifting an accent on a paradiddle isn't yeah. obvious to people. You know, sometimes no. they need it. I mean, I did for the longest time. I needed very careful instruction. And I was never a natural player. I had to work very, very hard, even on just the basic rock beat that we all learned. It took me like a full weekend to get of, of trying it all the time. So I, I kind of understand it from, from both points. But it was, I had to be kind of taught how to, learn if that makes sense and taught how to develop myself yeah that's a good point um you know teaching someone to teach themselves mm. and it, yeah finding a concept and learning how to develop it and turn it into your own thing mm -hmm. yeah I, for me that that if i use a, a classic example of the the syncopation book yeah know, right page well 38 page 38 you know that still winds me up I'll get into this discussion in a second, but, right. um, <laughs> you know, so syncopation exercise one. And once I, I understood and was taught how to use that exercise for developing certain different independence type of exercises, then I would come up with other ways of doing it. Okay. And, then, and, and that's the thing, you know, just understanding that, you know, that's just taking a concept and running with it and learning how to develop yeah. it. And then the same with, you know, drum set vocabulary, not necessarily using the syncopation exercise, but, you know, how, how can I take this sticking, you know, let's say if I'm playing triplet, triplets and it's just right, left, left, right, left, left, right, mm -hmm. left, left, you know, and so you're mo moving your right hand around the kit, your two lefts are staying on the snare drum. So that's, you know, that's one sounding thing. So what happens if I take the, uh, the, the, the two lefts and occasionally replacing those two lefts with two kicks? Right. What if I take that right hand accent and change that to a kick? You know, so so then and then changing the subdivision and and so then taking that one idea and just expanding it. So that that that's the type of thing that I encourage students to get into, right? Just so that they can be a little bit more explorative in the sense that they're, you know, at least asking the question, "What can I do with this? Yeah. How can I make this more interesting? How can I make this sound?" A, a, a way that in a way that's not being played the same way by everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're yeah. kind of in, you, you, you know, sort of individualizing that sort of, yeah. uh, you know, any concept. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. You know, I, I have this friend um, who's a really great drummer, but you know, he always plays the same six stroke fill. And I said, man, like, <laughs> you, you, like there, there are other ways to do this. Like just <laughs> like, just expand your brain a little bit, you know. I don't. I shouldn't let it wind me up, but it winds me up. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah. There's tons of we've all we've all got that player in there somewhere that we know. Like, just if you just yeah, just just, just something to a little split thing. it into two, man. Maybe <laughs> play like just the same thing twice and then change. It. I don't know. Why do you get wound up about syncopation? I'm interested to know this because oh, oh yeah, so because I've well, well, studied I, this book I, for years. I've um had this issue. I've noticed that, you know, if we go back to when I was 15 and learning, you basically learnt from a few books. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about, you know, early 80s, there were no DVDs, no, no. Uh, no VHS. No, GADs hadn't come out yet. The, the first time I saw Up Close, the GAD, it was uh, maybe a third generation copy of a right. copy. It was so, like the yeah. copy was pretty bad. Yeah. Um, so, and, and that was, I saw that in 85 for the first time or 84. But uh, so when I was learning from Frank, you know, there were a handful of books you learned from. So it was, you know, say Stick Control, mm -hmm. Syncopation. Uh, the Chapin book. 
Yeah, I didn't do that one right, though. Okay. Um, so, you know, like we had limited text, but they were kind of the standard texts you, you worked out of. And so, and so I bought those books. All these years later, a lot of those books, for whatever reasons, are being reprinted and republished and updated. So when I went to, the, to New York for the first time, I was having lessons with, um, you know, Marvin Smith and I had a lesson with Adam Nussbaum. I had a few lessons with um, Joe Morello. And, uh-huh. and um, you know, everyone refers to page 37. You know, it, it was like this thing. Everyone knew what page 37 was. So I figured, well, why did someone decide to add an extra page? So now that our kind of uh, teaching vin- vernacular or whatever, you know, has to be adjusted for some, someone's mistake. Uh, I thought... Maybe I'm getting this wrong and I don't have a copy of the book in front of me. I can't remember when my copy was printed, but page 37 was the sort of introduction page and then page 38 was where the exercises started. Well, traditionally, page 37 was syncopation exercise one. Right, yeah. okay. So, so, and that really was, that kind of became the benchmark for, um, you know, the exercise that you would use to develop jazz independence or anything yeah. like that. So there was that. And then, you know, more recently, I've seen people turn up to lessons with new copies of, the Charles Wilcoxon book. I've got a Charles Wilcoxon book, which was reprinted and recopied with mistakes. Oh. So, which is heartbreaking. But even more heartbreaking is: um, Are you familiar with the NARD book, the National Association of Rudimentary Drummers? I've not seen the book, but I know what you're talking. You know about. what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. So, it it's a beautiful book if you have the original copy because the whole thing is handwritten in this oh, beautiful, wow. you know, just beautiful font. And uh, all the headings, uh, this beautiful cursive or sort of cal- calligraphy type mm-hmm. of um, text. And it was you could see that someone had hand copied it. It was really beautiful. And for whatever, and that's what made the book unique. Mm-hmm. For whatever reasons, some publishing company decided to reprint the whole thing. And uh, not only has it just completely taken away the character of that book, mm-hmm. but you know they've done things like they've written the snare drum line on the floor tom line and, oh uh, no and that, you know that sort of thing winds me up so well, that's just that's awful it's it's really awful it's really awful and i, I just imagine some corporate at the <laughs> you know at the publishing company thinking okay well you know we got to we got to update the look of this so we can sell more copies and that's what they did to it you know they 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 destroyed it so um so I, I do, I, I kind of joke about the whole, you know, page 38 thing. Yeah, but it, these are historic things for a reason and they're still yeah. around for a reason. You know, if you look at, for those of you that don't know, syncopation is a, a, is a long established drum text. It, it's a very, very, very simple book that has a line written on the snare drum and a line written on the bass drum and it's a series of rhythmic exercises. It's very simple. So it starts off with uh, quarter notes, then eighth notes, triplets, and sixteenth notes, and that's it. And then on, on page thirty-seven, we start with syncopated exercises. Now, jazz guys would be taught to play the, the snare drum first of all in the left hand, whilst you were playing four-way coordination. So you're playing quarter notes in the kick, two and four and a hats, playing the right time, and then as you get on a bit, you swap which limb plays the the main melody line or you split the melody line up between limbs. So for, for instance, anything that has got a tail, or sorry, a tie, or is a, is a quarter note would be played usually in the bass drum to start with, and then quarter notes, sorry, eighth nice. notes would be in the snare drum, and then you swap it around, and then you play, you swap the bass drum with the hi-hat, and then you swap the hi-hat with the snare drum, and so on. So it has a multitude of ways of being played. And it's still around for a reason because it just works. Have you ever seen Alan Dawson's book? No, I no, I haven't. I know of it. Well, and I, I've I've done some exercises from that, but I don't have the, the entire book. So Alan Dawson took this this and just ripped the hell out of it, and and it became sort of that book on steroids, and it's pretty immense. Um, and then things like uh, what's the guy's name who wrote the book? Ted Reed. Thank you. I, could, I was thinking I had Stone's head name in my head there. Ted Reed took it and wrote Syncopation 2, where he took all the syncopation exercises he'd written from page 37 onwards and wrote them in triplet form. And what you would do with it is you would typically play it 
as a single stroke a sticking exercise or anything that had an accent, the right hand played and the left hand played every other triplet. So some of those exercises got pretty roasting when you're playing seven notes in your left hand, you know. It's a pretty amazing text and I think everybody who is serious about playing jazz music at some point kind of needs to buy it. Yeah, I think it's a really great way of teaching people independence, mm-hmm. you know. And then and then away from jazz, there are so many other ways yeah, right. you can do it. So I, I think I've done a, I did a series, like a three-part series called Cinco Funk, where I took that page and um, played it in a funk. Okay, you know, we'll, like we'll link that in the description. Yeah, yeah, cool. We'll link those lessons. And that, the first video has had quite a few views. Um, so I, I'm assuming that people have really gotten into that uh, just because it might be a way that they haven't really. Yeah. Ch- I mean, even the first line. The first exercise, there's paradiddles in there. If there's paradiddles and paradiddles, if you line out the accents and yeah. write stickings out, they fall under the hands in really simple ways, but really beautifully melodic. It's kind of missing that even even just thinking about your fill-ins as being melodic and rhythmic in a different way than digga 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 digga. You know what I mean? Yeah, hearing accents that are off the beat is really yeah important. Yeah, yeah. and then you would put that accent on a tom or on a, a cymbal with a bass drum, and you're you're creating. Three lots of vocabulary for yourself from one bar. Yeah. You know, one bar. The amount you can get out of the first bar of that exercise. Then you add two bars. And then before you know it, you've got like that phrase, the four-bar the four bar phrase that's the first line of the first exercise. It's really hip. And this, is, again, goes back to what we were talking about before, about concepts and just taking an idea and running with it. Mm-hmm. And, you mm-hmm. know, like you mentioned, it's one bar and you've, instantly got three ideas from just one bar of music Mm -hmm, yeah talking of which uh you've written a book you've written two books yeah yeah and i watched um the episode on mixing paradiddles uh and grooves man super hip like get hip to that team darren's got a great um lesson on taking four paradiddle stickings right hand on the hi-hats left hand on the snare drum and just coming up with super hip grooves Really cool. Like, oh, some of it sounds like James Brown. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, like, when you listen to those accents out with the first bass drum, like, that could be on a James Brown record. Right? Yeah. The the inspiration for all of that uh, comes from David Garibaldi. Right. And, again, he's another one who's just amazing, <laughs> you know, amazing yeah, conceptually. And and I remember, uh, you know, getting his book. Uh, you know, the the book that really changed the way I play the drums was Future Sounds. Okay, that really just completely upended me. <laughs> and 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 so um, yeah, I kind of understood what was going on and and got really excited about learning more of that stuff. And then so yeah, you know let's play a groove that's based on a single paradiddle. So you can do that and there's a whole different way, a bunch of different ways you can do that, you know, by shifting the accents and adding kick. But then then I thought, well, hang on a second, you don't really need to stick to one paradiddle in a bar. <laughs> so, you know, you could have like two beats of a single paradiddle, a beat of an inward paradiddle and a beat of a reverse paradiddle. And that sort of changes the the landscape of the of the of the pattern because then you can put accents in different places. Uh, yeah. that that feel more natural and it, it again it's just that again the same thing of just trying to figure out how to expand the vocabulary yeah and, and you, like not even thinking about okay you've just put four paradiddles together as a groove but it's also a fill in yeah yeah there's that too so like you can actually you don't even need to change what you're playing in your hands you just change where you're playing it and the same thing that you've just been grooving is now your fill in yeah and that's super musical because you're filling grooves. If that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's, it's super cool. So is the whole book, your book, um, laid out that way? Because I've not had a chance to get a copy. So I haven't seen how it's all, it's all laid out. You know? Firstly, I'll get you a copy. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, that wasn't a, give me a copy. No, it's a, you, you can have one whether you like it or not. <laughs> um, the, the very first thing that appears in that book is a paradiddle. Right. And then, you know, we develop that paradiddle to a develop the technique and the sounds required to play the rest of the book. Okay. And also then we take those paradiddles, so the single paradiddle and the three inversions uh, to make grooves. And then we learn how to 
and then the, the book is divided into different chapters, one of which is linear grooves. Okay. So I, I, I mm -hmm. talk about how to make um, linear grooves out of paradiddles. Okay. And then the, 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 the other chapter, one of the other chapters is um, layered grooves. Mm -hmm. And it, it was really just this collection of um, information that I was getting and wanted to compile my own ideas into one book so right. that, you know, you could buy a book on linear drumming, you could buy a book on layered grooves mm. or whatever. But I just wanted to, again, it's not a, it's not a massive book. It's not like, you know, uh, you know, an inch wide or whatever. <sighs> but, it, but again, it's, it teaches you how to take the concept and expand on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and then the follow up book is a play along where, you know, the we take all of those ideas and we put them in the context of a you know musical you know piece of music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll I'll come back to that one in a minute because off the is there a a thought for a follow up to it? Not at this stage. Okay, no. Just curious if you you know you decide to do the whole thing now with a double paradiddle or. A... Uh, uh, no, Do you know no, what I mean? Not so. No, not so much. Okay. I, th I think. I think. I think the concept pretty much it takes it, care it, of that. Yeah, it takes care of that. Okay. Um, you're also a composer. Yeah. Um, which is super. I, I, I love talking to drummers about this because I've got a bunch of music written out and that's out and about as well. So, from your point of view, how do you start composing? I I basically hear it in my head. You know, I, right. I'll I'll start hearing, uh, you know, melodies, and and sort of chord changes or chord structures. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think I've really written um, a piece of music that was just built on a drum groove. You know, I hear no, everything I, else I'm first. Saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get, I get away from the kit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, to me, it's, you know, if I'm lying in bed, <laughs> unable to sleep, I'll, I'll hear a melody or I might hear something, uh, you know, in my head while I'm, Walking the dogs or whatever, uh, and then and then the good melodies kind of stick, mm. and then they become, you know, ways of entertaining myself and singing these songs <laughs> to myself. It's a bit kind of weird like that. Oh, I like it. So so uh, yeah, that then uh, what do I do? Do you have uh, a piano? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, I then try to work out the um, um, you know what the yeah. Chord, yeah the harm the harmonic side of that, and and then I'll you know write it out or I'll I'll record it. Mm you know, by way of MIDI. Mm -hmm. So I think all of, you know, my first album was, you know, really composed that way. Mm -hmm. It was just songs that I heard in my head. Yeah, I, I think drummers write some of the most melodic music around because they don't think about changes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, the, someone else, you're not the first person to say that. When I first moved back to Australia after living in London, I was living with my parents and I had no, I had no practice space, so I couldn't actually practice the drums. So I thought, well, what do, what do I do? So I took piano lessons. Oh, amazing. And, okay. And and I really did that just to uh, learn more about harmony mm -hmm. and yeah. and specifically jazz harmony. Yeah, yeah. So I went through that you know process of learning two five ones and um, yeah. getting sort of hip with um, you know extended harmony yeah, yeah. and things like that. And that really, yeah, yeah, and it just it, it just meant that when I was, uh, you know, writing tunes, I had a little bit more armory to to write the sort of things that I heard, but didn't know what what they were. Yeah, so if you hear a note that's not diatonic, you don't freak out, and you can actually find a chord that suits it that doesn't necessarily in the key or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly that sort of thing, but but also knowing why. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and how to then make it functional, you know, so that. When you hand it to a saxophone player, it doesn't cry. And you're like, how am I going to make these changes? Because th these are drummers' changes. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I used to get that a lot, dude. They're drummers' changes. Like, I don't know. Give me a week, you know, to go away and just get the fingers of it, round it, you know. Funny. Yeah. I, I would recommend, you know, depending where you're at in your um, sort of musical upbringing, let's say. But, you know, if, learning a harmonic instrument is is really important i think and you know even if you even if it's just you know playing a, you know acoustic guitar yeah, and, a bass or something you know just understanding why the music is shifted and and how you respond to that as a player you know if it's a 251 you know it's probably coming at the end of the form yeah yeah exactly um i i think a lot of times when i get charts for example on a gig it might be 
uh, just a lead sheet with chords. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I've got to follow. So at least having some understanding of, you know, where the resolution <laughs> points are harmonically will inform me as to where I might put a fill, for yeah. example. Yeah, yeah, totally. Just did, things like that. Did you learn and work on things like intervals and, and on that? Well, I had to do all of that stuff in school, in right. college. Right, okay, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had, you had to, you know, oral class was mandatory, yeah. so you had brutal. to learn. Yeah, I, that, I find, found that really hard. Yeah. That, that's, an, that's another interesting thing because I, I'm fascinated by it, but that is something that's mandatory, at least in Australian colleges, music colleges, is oral training is, you know, you know if you want to have a music course, the, the, you, oral has to be part of it. Yeah. And that's AU. R-E-L, not oral, as in singing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oral. So ear development yeah, yeah. And, and sight singing and things like that. Yeah, solfege. Um, the concern I have with this, and this is a little controversial, oh, is that... Bring it. I'm here for it. <laughs> is that that seems <clears throat> to take priority over rhythm. Yeah, I had this very conversation with Chris Allison yesterday. Yeah, and, and it's, it's really frustrating because therefore you breed... Um, a bunch of musicians <laughs> who, regardless of what they've done in college, still have trouble sight singing, but they have even more trouble playing rhythmically, I'm accurately, <laughs> and all of that. And rhythm is the is the common do denominator yep. amongst all instruments, including the voice. Yes. We all need to understand rhythm. We all need to sing, play in time, and yet that's almost... Well, if you even no. look at things like the history of the snare drum, was used to, to the rudiments were designed to tell soldiers what to do. Yeah. The rhythms told you what to do, whether it be get out of the camp because they're coming over the hill or, or whatever it was. So it speaks to everybody, even people that aren't musicians, you know? And like you say, yeah. there's not enough focus put on it. No, there's, there should be more. And the, the, the greatest musicians in the world are the ones with the best time. Yeah. So it, it could be it could be anyone from, you know, Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, Michael Brecker, Pat Metheny, mm. you know, James Taylor, whoever. Those all of those musicians have absolute killer time. And and it's almost like you don't notice it. You know, you just because we're too busy listening to the words of a song or the licks or whatever, but when you start to appreciate time on a kind of mature level, you start to realise that the people that you've been listening to and whose music you've been enjoying actually have killer time and that's kind of a big part of what makes them sound so good. Yeah, it's only in the last 10 or so years that I've really thought about what playing in time is, you know, and what it means. And I mean, I'm not talking about, like, where you nudge the bass drum, do you nudge it forward or behind, just having time that doesn't move. It's super consistent, you know. Yeah. So that everybody else that's sitting on top of it feels and sounds good. Yeah. And then everyone who's sitting on top of it has their own sense of really good time and then also has an ability to lock in with everyone else. <clears throat> I think Steve Gadd said a really great thing. He said, you know, a groove is basically an agreement amongst yeah. a bunch of musicians. Yeah, I think that's gold, man. It's really, it's so, uh, it's so important. That's a great thing to think about all the time. Yeah, and there was a... There's a podcast that's been doing the rounds forever called I'd Hit That. I don't know if yeah. you're right. So he, he talks to Jeff Babco, who played keyboards on James Taylor's tour with Gad. And there was one particular song of the night that Jeff wasn't playing. So he used to sit behind Steve's riser and watch him play the song. And he's like, he's not playing the hi-hats. Like, why is he not playing? Like, what's going on, man? Like, why is he not playing the hi-hats? So just bugged him for like the whole tour. It comes to the last night and they're all at dinner and he's like, Steve, I've got to ask, man. I can't, like, why don't you play the hi-hats in that song? And he just goes, because James is playing it, man. Huh. It's just like, it's in the guitar. What are the hi-hats going to add? And he's like, where do you get to that level where you can go, well, this guy's time's good enough that I don't even need to play it. I don't even need to mark it. Yeah. Go, boom. Go, boom. You know, just amazing. It's, well, you know, he's another, he's firstly my favourite, you know, like he was like the biggest influence. God. Yeah. Right. And the fact that he is so willing to 
move away from convention yeah. because, you know, in this instance that you're talking about, you know, he doesn't need to play the hi-hat. It's already there played by somebody else. And that he's just so prepared to play a kick on one and three, snare drum on two and four, listen like hell to the, the, to the guitar part and be totally satisfied with that because he is putting the interest of the music way ahead of the conventions of playing the drums is, in my opinion, is what, what keeps someone like that working at yeah. the age of, he's going to be 79 in yeah, a few no. days. But not even that. The idea that he's already, he's thinking about yeah. it. Like and he's that. heard it. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you know, you, we, the, the advent of the internet is amazing, but you watch the onslaught of, of all this information and it's all the same. And then you hear a guy who's going to be 79 say something that sounds like he's an alien because the first thing we do when we sit down at the drum set is play the right hand and the right foot together. Yeah. It's the first thing we all do, whether it's on a, you know, it's the first play of the day or whatever. It's typically, <laughs> and he's just like, nah, don't need it. Nah, I don't <laughs> want to do that, man. Like, why would I do that? He's just like, <laughs> you know, it's like something, it's like Gandalf. You know, there's just Gandalf's on the drums today. <laughs> do you know what I mean? There's like a wizard, sage wizard just playing. Um, and I've now lost oh yeah so yeah we're talking about the kind of importance of time how many times have you seen a young band right and you think they're amazing if if, if like for, they just spent a year learning to play in time they would be like four times the band yeah you know well again maybe there's just too much overwhelming inform information available that, that sort of showcases chops and all of that sort of stuff but if you listen to or watch any early Beatles performances, you know, we, we're talking about a band that just sounds incredible mm. in place in time together. I had this really great opportunity to see a, a, a film footage of the first, uh, well, the only time that the Beatles came to Australia. And it was footage from their concert in Melbourne from right. 1964. And they played the whole concert, so that means they, they that means they played I think three support acts, and then the Beatles came out. Right, so wow. that was the entire concert, and each band played for about twenty minutes. I think the Beatles played for twenty five minutes or half an hour. And two things: uh, when by the time the Beatles got up to play, the audience volume <laughs> <laughs> had you know tripled, or like it just went through the roof. So. I don't think they could hear themselves. There were no fallback wedges. Mm. It was a small PA, oh. but and they were also the tightest band. Really, like so in terms of pocket, in terms of harmonies, the harmonies. I don't know how they sang so well without being able to hear themselves, <laughs> but that came through hundreds of gigs, yeah. the hundreds of gigs that they did as a band before yeah. that. So, you know, you think about all the gigs that they played in Hamburg mm. and, you know, I think they played for like six hours on end and then they and then all the gigs that they did at the Cavern Club. So they racked up a lot of hours they and they played a lot of music and they, they were really tight as a band. It's funny with the Beatles, isn't it? Because I think Ringo's polarizing, he polarizes people based on the recorded material that's out there. But you forget the guy put a shift in, like you're talking about. I, I, I mean, there's the people that, I mean, it's celebrated people that, that, that maybe heavy Ringo that couldn't play a six hour shift, like couldn't do it. Yeah. You know, um, there's people we talk to I mean, in Scotland when you play a wedding, you play for four hours. There's people like, you play that long? Yeah. That's how long you play. So imagine nearly doubling that. Yeah. You know, for pocket money, you know, because they wouldn't have been paid handsomely back then, probably. You know, they would have just been, it's almost banned on the wall in it. They're just at the back and people are milling around doing whatever they're doing in the bars or whatever they're playing. And not only that, they amassed knowledge of the styles. They knew how to play rock and roll. Yeah, they did. You know, because they had no choice. You want to you want to make the people dance, you've got to play what they want to hear. You know, so they learned how to, how to play those little Richard tunes properly and all that. And then if you, have you watched Get Back? Yeah. I've only watched the first hour, but even in the first hour, Ringo's astonishing. His hands are ridiculous, and he never gets credit for it. You hear him tapping about on the snare, like, boy, he's got some set of hands on him. You know, they're clean, super articulate, in time, just sitting patiently waiting, and then plays like the best thing. Like yeah. the most amazing part you could have ever thought of. 
Yeah, I enjoyed watching that a lot and, and a lot for him because he was in, yeah incredibly patient. He would uh, just sit there and then I guess he's just absorbing all the stuff that's going on musically around him and then when it t t comes time to play, it, 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 he plays a great part um, and it all feels good. You know, a friend of mine who's an incredible piano player back home was saying to me, you know, I really never got this reverence towards Ringo until just recently and that is that his drum parts are so amazing that you could listen to the drum part and know what song it is mm -hmm. because he didn't just play a generic rock yeah. beat for every song. And, you, yeah. you know, if, if, if Paul McCartney had have approached me or John Lennon had have approached me, and let's say an example would be, you know, come together and they start playing that dun, da, 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 just guitar and voice, I would think, oh, yeah, okay, boom, da, yeah. Da, yeah. Da, you know, it, that that to me never seemed like the default approach. It was like, okay, what what sort of drum part would work well with this, and what what drum part would give this a unique, give this song a certain uniqueness. And you could say the same thing for like Fifty Ways to Leave Your Lover. You know, you could play a simple backbeat groove for the whole thing, but when you give that give give a song a particular uniqueness in terms of the 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 drum part. It, it, it sort of becomes the song becomes greater than the sum of its parts because all of a sudden the song has a real character that goes beyond convention. Mm. I mean, the, the 50, 50 ways to leave your lover is, I, I, I remember hearing that for the first time and I just thought it was the most incredible thing I'd ever heard. Have you watched his Rick Beato interview? Not yet. Not well, he yet. talks about that very thing. Uh, okay. I won't spoil it for you. Okay. I just, I'll, I'll, I'll let you watch it. That I've, I've got about two thirds of the way through that interview and it's sensational. Um, but yeah, the, the, there's a whole thing on, on that tune. So it's, it's quite fascinating when you hear them talk about it. But like you watch Get Back and you, th you, you see them play and you think, Ringo had that part in his head from the minute the chords start. He, kn he just knew what to do. It's like his hands just went to the right drums and just whatever McCartney or Lennon played, he was like, yeah, cool, I got this. Like It's like he... He was inside their brain when they wrote it. It's really weird. Cause yeah, I guess by that point, you know, they had been playing together for a long time and had, you know, a long time relatively. Yeah, yeah. And he, he and also by that point, he probably had some idea of, you know, how the, the other three guys operated. Yeah, for sure. But to even have that level of empathy. Yeah. As a human. I, and I think that's just really great musical empathy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But... I, it's 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 really rare. It, yeah, it is rare. I, I think it wouldn't hurt. Here I am, you know, going to be the angry man, yeah, yelling at the cloud. But it really wouldn't hurt a lot of young drummers to look watch that documentary. Or oh, just listen to Ringo. <laughs> or, or just listen to Ring, Ringo. Like, yeah. Try and play like um, Ticket to Ride and get it right. Yeah. Like just get it right. I and mean, the amount of people that play come and get it wrong, they go down the toms. They don't go up the toms. You know, Ringo went up the toms. If you listen to it. Yeah, like, um, yeah, I, I haven't had a because by that stage he was playing the the five piece kit, wasn't he? I can't remember. I don't. I don't know my history well and, enough. And, but, and also, yeah, he would have led that left handed with left handed. Yeah, so he goes up the way. Yeah, I'm gonna have to have a. I'm gonna have to learn how to play that properly. Yeah, now, he you've he inspired goes, me. He goes up the way, man, and it's because for years I played it wrong. And Paul, who's who, who's shop as his massive Beatles and Ringo fan, he's like, you played it wrong. Like, he goes up the way, and you listen back. Fuck yeah, he does. Yeah, we just automatically assume he goes down yeah. there because that's how we think. Well, you know, getting back to you know, uh, sort of a parallel talking about fifty ways to leave your lover. A lot of people didn't know because we hadn't seen the way Gad played it, where he was firstly playing his left hand on the mm -hmm. hi hat and splitting the hi hat between his left hand and left foot. Yeah. So when we first heard it, we thought it was right, right, you know, right on the hi-hat, left hand on the snare drum. And then you think, okay, why would he do that? Yeah, yeah but it just what, it's what yeah. makes it and him really unique. When I was studying, there was a, a percussion instructor at the college, a guy called Steve Foreman, who is an LA legend. Steve, is, he was on everything. And he's, was that the same Steve Foreman who played with Lee Ritt now yeah, and those yeah. guys? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I studied with Steve for a bit. Wow, yeah. cool. Heavy, like, you just monster player, monster and a beautiful human. 
But he talked about playing with Gad because he he played with Gad, and they, he would he would like Steve like like how are you thinking about this stuff? And he said like if he was playing with Chick for example, he wouldn't think in eight bar phrases. He would think in a thirty two bar phrase. So he would think from the top of the form to the end of the form. So he's basically through composing his drum part to then resolve on one, whereas everybody else was thinking in a box. They were thinking in smaller phrases. Gad had the ability to think from top to bottom, and that's astonishing when you think about some of that music. He played Humpty Dumpty and all that stuff, and like I played Humpty Dumpty from a recital. That form's bonkers, but yeah. Gad, Gad could navigate it top to bottom without really thinking about it. Amazing. So far ahead of his time. The sound of his kit, so far ahead of what was happening. The sound of that ride cymbal, like a bin lid before anybody was playing them. You know, like that dr- super dry, bright. He was just streets ahead of everybody, man. Like, <laughs> I remember talking to um, a drummer in Melbourne, and he was telling me about the time that he first saw Steve Gadd play. Steve Gadd played in Melbourne with, it might have been Hubert Laws, or one of the, you know, it was a, very famous flute player. And th- this friend of mine was in the support band. And we're talking early 70s right. here. And he, he, he said that he had a look behind Steve Gadd's drums and just saw them covered in tape. And he thought, this is... And <laughs> Steve Gadd really wasn't well known back in those days at all. And he just did not know how it was going to work until he heard Steve Gadd play it. Yeah. He was blown away how good he made those drums sound because yeah. you know he, it's steve's got this beautiful touch and and uh and so it, it, you know the clarity and the sounds that he was producing as a result of his technique was was really beautiful and and he was able to do that with a very dead sounding kit yeah like before anyone even thought about it we, yeah you know, before the 80s had happened and we were taping the shit out of everything and taking bottom heads off of drums to put mics in them you know that was more seventies, but you, you know, you get the idea. It was just yeah, that and the facility. You know, no one had heard anybody play. Um, like I mean, when you get to hear late in the evening and all that, no one had really heard that in mainstream music before. Yeah, and and Gad's like, yeah, I'm gonna just steal all of this mental Latin stuff that Mozambiques and folk are like, what? what, 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 what's going on? You know, amazing, amazing, and to see, to see him sort of still doing it and still have that touch. Like no one else can play Steve's drums. Anybody else that sits on Steve's drums is going to sound awful. Yeah. They're just going to, because yeah. the drums are, he has them in a way that works for him, like nothing else. The, the fullness of sound that comes out of a drum, like the 10 inch toms, like a Timbali, but still has this big, full sound. God, what's he got? That, he's just got a little bit of magic in him. Yeah. His brain, man. I'd be interested to yeah. know how that. Have you got Gadiments? Yeah. I haven't got it yet, but is it, is it worth picking it's, up? It's, it's great. It's kind of almost like a modern day Nard book. Right, okay. You know, the thing I love about the Nard book is I can open it up and just pick a solo and just spend some time working on it and just learning it as a piece. Gad's book is probably less less like pieces in that sense, but they kind of are like pieces because it might be a 16-bar exercise, but they're just so musical and you kind of do get a sense of how he hears phrases when mm. you practice those mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I recommend it if you're a okay. snare drum rudiment nerd. Yeah, I need to get more of that stuff together. Like, I, I, you know, you do a bit of it at college and all that, but, you know, it, it goes by the wayside if you don't keep on top of it. And yeah. I haven't kept on top of it. You know, it's the first thing to go, really, is the, is the left hand. is just like, ah, oh, okay, that needs some work, you know. But it, it is pretty remarkable to start to hear the music and all that. And of course, we're in a country where that's prevalent. You know, snare drum is everywhere. You Part know. of the culture. It is, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not celebrated as much as it should be. It's kind of seen as a bit twee at times, you know. it's, it's I think it's celebrated more by other cultures coming in than, than us. You know, we, we need to get on top of it a little more. But you can hear some of the music, hear some of the swing inside that stuff. It's really heavy, man. Really heavy swing, you know, and people just kind of hear it as the sort of oh, it's, it's it's up there with bagpipes. It's kind of what are you doing? That's like, <laughs> no, bagpipes are an outside instrument all the way over there. Nobody wants, you know. So yeah, I need to get. It. So I'll, I'll maybe check it, check it out. Cause yeah, it's, it's it's good. Readily available online, I think now is is is, is Gadiments. So um, what's next for you, man? What's what after the tour? What's happening uh, after the tour? 
after this tour, we the band flies back to uh, Australia and we play one more show with me. So I'm, okay. I'm filling in right. for, for this tour. We play uh, a show at the Blues and Roots Festival in Byron Bay. Then I'm giving myself a week off. Excellent. And then, you know, just back into gigging in yeah. Melbourne. Um, I've got a tour in September. Okay. Uh, playing. So th- th- there's, there's a film that came out in the 1980s called Dirty Dancing. Oh, yeah. That, Patrick Swayze. It's a small film. Was that? It's a small film. Yeah, it's a small film. film. Yeah, yeah. Like indie release, I think. Flew under the radar <laughs> for a while. And so what? there's the tour. I also did this tour last year, but we, we're doing a bigger version of this tour where they play the, the film, but all, of, all the songs are played by a live Amazing. band and it's all synced up with the film. It, it's so much fun. So that's pretty much all of my September taken care Amazing. of. So that's like Latin grooves plus uh, all those 50s and 60s stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and then oddly an 80s classic. And then oddly an 80s classic. But that that's great. And that's a, that's a fun, that's a really fun gig, largely because of the audience. You know, the yeah. audience is probably 80% female who just scream their guts drunk. out every time. You're drunk. Yeah, every time Patrick Swayze comes onto the screen. So it's it's real fun. It's a real celebration of that music and and that era. So, so that's September. I'm going to New York for a couple of weeks with my brother for oh, a holiday in excellent. May. And then, yeah, it, the, the rest of the year is really just, just gigging locally. I mean, the Cat Empire have an Australian tour and they have a US tour, but that's with Daniel playing the right. drums. Okay. And, um, and then I've got gigs with my own band. So I, I have, I've put a band together called the Darren Perugia yeah. Project and we've got a gig in May, um, and then, yeah, business as that, usual. Yeah, business as usual. Excellent. So this is, you know, what I'm doing now is is very uh, out of the ordinary for me. Right. Well, I appreciate so much that you took time out of your your touring schedule and your your um, tourism schedule <laughs> and my tourism and my sleeping schedule yeah, to to come and nerd out. So I, I really appreciate it, man. It's been great to chat and and thank you so much for for coming on. Well, so. thank, thanks for having me and thanks for reaching out and asking me to do this, man. I was really very very happy that. this Oh uh, no worries, man. And we'll send you through all the stuff and you can do with it if you see fit and tag it and share it, whatever you want. But yeah, I really appreciate you coming on, man. So thanks so much. Thank you. Great. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Drummers Only Podcast. Please leave us a review and make sure you subscribe. If you need any more information about us or any gear mentioned, head on over to drummersonly.co.uk and make sure you follow us on all of our social channels at drummersonlyuk. Thanks for listening. Peace.